I am Bernard Leotard. I am uh, currently a research fellow at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, my training has been mostly in engineering and uh, systems. Uh, so uh, I'm applying systems theory to money systems, which economics usually doesn't do. The first time I realized that there was something wrong with the money system dates back to the 70s, uh, first half of the 70s. At that time I was living in Latin America. Uh, I was working for, at one specific point, working a lot in Peru, uh, optimizing the hard currency income for Peru. And uh, I started noticing something that was going on over Latin America. Uh, which was the beginning of the debt bubble that exploded in the, in the 1980s or 1981. So I decided I am crazy or I'm seeing something that isn't normal. So I was, uh, to determine whether I was crazy or not, I decided to take a, what I call a reverse sabbatical. A sabbatical is when a professor goes to the real world. A reverse sabbatical is when a guy from the real world goes and plays professor. So that's what I did the first time. I've done that several times in my life. Um, and uh, so that's when I started teaching at the University of Louvain International Finance and wrote a book on Latin America. That's when I became aware that something systemically was funny on the global system. I announced in that book that there was going to be a, a major crisis in Latin America in the early 80s. The book was published in 79 and it happened in 81. So. Uh, the second step, however, was uh, under the influence of uh, the only mentor I ever had, uh, who is, whose name is Willis Harmon. Willis told me uh, back in 92, uh, Bernard, you have been trained for 25 years to understand money like nobody ever has because of my different positions, which are unusual. I believe I'm the only central banker who actually has uh, managed uh, an offshore currency fund. It doesn't happen in the same life. Right? Or being professor at the university and being president of an electronic payment system. You know, uh, or working with major multinationals and developing countries. These are different angles. And it was the common ground for all of them happens to be money. But I wasn't aware of it until Willis told me. Okay, so he added, he, you need to write down what you learned because that's going to be useful for lots of other people. So that's how it started. I thought I was going to do that for three years and then go on the run with the rest of my life. And uh, it's now 20 years ago. Uh, and I started publishing in about 15 years ago. So, uh, and I can't get rid of the topic. <laughs> the topic sticks <laughs> because of events that happen in the world, you know, where we're now actually, uh, unfortunately, exactly where I expected us to be where I forecast back in 99 uh, the situation that we're currently in which is uh, the convergence of aging society unemployment climate change and species extinction and monetary instability and that these things together will force us before 2020 to actually change our money system I still stick to that I still think that we're going to be forced to change it before 2020. But it's much later than I hoped. The paradigm we need to leave is the idea that we need to do everything with a single currency. The monoculture of a single currency. All patriarchal societies from the beginning, from uh, Sumer, 3200 BC, to Babylon, Greece, Rome, and since the Renaissance, the Western world, uh, these are all, uh, all patriarchal societies, and all of them have imposed a currency, top-down, a single currency, top-down, with uh, interest built in. And there is a logic for that, because of course this is an extraction device. You know, it provides resources to the top, automatically, without having to do anything. Okay? Uh, the interest is by definition a transfer of uh, resources from all the users to to the issues. <laughs> so uh, that's what I think we need to draw, abandon. 
So I'm not talking about getting rid of the conventional money system, which some people are. The reformists are actually mostly going in that direction, either giving the monopoly to issue to government, or you know changing the rules so substantially that uh, things are different. But they stay if you stay within the paradigm of a single currency, you're still trapped, is my view. So that's why we need to go from what I call a monoculture to a monetary ecosystem. And in a monetary ecosystem, you have things at different scales. You have specialized niche. Uh, and together, they may give a lot more resilience than is possible with, any, with a single monoculture. We need to emphasize that a monoculture is more efficient. Efficient in terms of, if you define efficiency in terms of volume, per unit of time, volume per year of production of trees or timber. Uh, monocultures are very efficient, no argument, but they're very brittle. When I'm, when I'm talking about a monetary ecosystem, imagine that besides the bank, that money, that conventional money, we also have business-to-business -business currencies. We also have cities issuing currencies for their own social and ecological purposes. We are talking about nonprofits doing that. Now, I can give examples for each one of them. Uh, one of them, on the, the, on the business to business, the Wier is the granddaddy uh, in Switzerland, which is well known. Uh, the second example would be uh, for cities, what they're beginning to do in England now with uh, the Bristol Pound and the, and the, and the, the Brixton Pound, uh, is cities issuing and getting involved in trying to address their systems. Uh, for your grandmother, uh, it could be a neighborhood currency taking care of her, like we have in the Furia Kipo in Japan. So, all these things need to be in place. And by the way, I need to warn that we can have too many at a certain point. But we're so far from that. From theoretical perspectives, we know that there is a balance. Don't overshoot. Okay? But we need more than one for sure. And I would say we need about half a dozen in these different niches. And then we are getting to a stable system. As a citizen, I claim that basically every citizen has the opportunity to, to play a role in this game. And the key thing is really, if, if you can join a leadership team, uh, for whatever scale, if you have credibility with your leadership team or with whom you're part, only on the size of a building, do it on the size of the building. If you have it at the size of a neighborhood, do it for the neighborhood. If you can do it at the scale of a city, because you have the mayor or other people that have credibility in the, at that scale, do it at that level. So it depends really on who you can gather around you and at what scale they have credibility that gives you the scale of the type of currency you can get involved in. Don't try to do a world currency if you only have the credibility in your building. Okay? <laughs> on the other hand, if you have credibility on a world level, Think about the world currency.